Welcome to the Gooder Podcast, where we talk with powerhouse women in CPG about their journeys to success. This episode is sponsored by Retail Voodoo, a brand development firm guiding mission-driven consumer brands to attract new and passionate consumer base, crush their categories through growth and innovation, and magnify their social and environmental impact. If your brand is in need of brand positioning, package design, or marketing activation, we are here to help. You can find more information at www.retail-voodoo.com. Hi, Diana Freik here. I am the host of the Gooder Podcast, where I get to talk with the powerhouse women in the food, beverage, and wellness categories about their journeys to success and their insights on the industry. Thanks for joining us today. Really quick, this episode is brought to you by Retail Voodoo. Retail Voodoo is a brand development firm. Our clients include Starbucks, Kind, REI, PepsiCo, Hi-Key, and many other market leaders. We provide strategic brand and design services for leading brands in the food, wellness, beverage, and fitness industries. If your goal is to increase market share, drive growth, or disrupt the marketplace with new and innovative ideas, give us a call. Let's talk. You can visit retail-voodoo.com or email me at info at retail-voodoo.com for more. Now, before we get to meet our guest officially, I'd like to just do a quick shout out to Miss Pertit Spencer of IO Foods, who made this introduction happen. IO Foods has introduced the love of West African food to American freezers, quick, easy, healthy meals that will delight the foodies and food explorers alike. Learn more about what Pertit and IO are up to at io-foods.com. Hi, IO. We love you. <laughs> we love you a lot. <laughs> so today we get to meet Miss Regina Anderson, who is the executive director of the Food Recovery Network, where she is responsible for setting the vision, strategy, and all fundraising efforts. Is that right? All fundraising efforts? It's a team effort, but yes, I set the strategy for that. Yeah, always grinding. (laughs) (laughs) For over a decade, Regina has worked in the nonprofit sector committed to social justice issues because she believes it is in this sector that she can make the biggest difference and that people are the engines of positive change. Love that. Overall, the Food Recovery Network's goal is to support the higher education It's to support higher education and to be the first sector where food recovery is the norm not the exception. But Regina won't stop there. Businesses, events, public institutions also have a role in reducing food waste at the source. They have they have a role to recover their surplus food and Regina wants to ensure they are integrated within the vibrant food recovery network to make that happen. Well, Miss Regina, welcome. Thank you so much, Diana. I'm so thankful to be here. And again, shout out to Pratit for making this connection for us. Yes. Uh, Well, so where are you calling from today? I am in Northeast DC, Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we'll, I'll ask this question afterwards because I'm always curious about the DC connection for these types of things. So let's start with this very first thing. I love it when my guests can tell a little bit about their organizations that they're working with right now. Tell us a little bit about the Food Recovery Network, why it exists, and who it services. Excellent. Thank you for that question. So Food Recovery Network actually started 10 years ago this month. Um, It was, yeah. So this is our, our, we're entering into our 10-year in existence. It was started by college students at the University of Maryland, and they saw the need um, for food recovery in the sense that they were in this unique ecosystem Mm -hmm. called higher education. Um, They wanted to begin to explore what kind of people they were going to be, you know, in terms of their volunteering efforts, in terms of what impact they felt that they could have. Um, And at the same time that that was going on, they were also, you know, taking their classes and learning a lot about some very complex problems that the whole entire world is facing and including domestically here in the United States, that is, you know, climate crisis and Mm -hmm. poverty and just very big and overwhelming issues Mm -hmm. with not a lot of solutions to those issues. And so they kind of combined, you know, their evolving desire to be good people Mm -hmm. 
seeing a need in their community and then understanding that actually, um, you know, by participating in food drives or, you know, um, creating, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, yeah. that that's really great, but it's only going to do so much. And right. so they created Food Recovery Network to address, um, you know, what they felt like was a pretty simple solution to a big problem, which was they knew in their communities, not enough people had the food that they deserved. And they saw through their internships and work studies um, that their, you know, that University of Maryland was actually throwing away a lot of really good food, food that at, oh. you know, 459 you could purchase it, but mm-hmm. at 501, it was destined to go into the trash can. Um, and so they devised a plan with the help of the dining provider at the University of Maryland to begin a system for recovering all that extra food that the um, dining you know, hall just wasn't able to um, sell mm-hmm. um, so that they could um, wrap that food up, keep it yeah. nice and safe. And they were able to deliver it to a church down the street from them. It wasn't going too far, kept it local. And then from there, you know, they started calling their friends, literally calling their friends across the country to begin the same process. It was beautiful. Oh my goodness. So I guess two questions from there. Are those original students slash founders, are they still involved in Food Recovery Network or did they birth it and move on to other great things? They, they birthed it and moved on to other great things, including, um, uh, so the first executive director, his name is Ben Simon, and maybe mm-hmm. some of your listeners have heard of him and his company. Um, he and one of the early um, um, you know, chapter founders, um, Ben Chesler, joined up and they created what is now called Imperfect Foods. Oh, a, yes. Yes. So they, so Ben Simon left FRN to mm-hmm. create this now amazing um, entity. So, um, so they are, we are, we love Imperfect Foods. We're in touch with them often, yes. um, but formally none of the original founders are gotcha. still involved with FRN, gotcha. you know, proper, but I do reach out to them. I talk to Ben Chesler often too. I bet. <laughs> well, how wonderful that Ben's next venture was literally the same concept, but from a different POV, still servicing the same needs, making Mm -hmm. sure that no food is wasted. Exactly. None of those resources wasted. That's that's amazing. And then when you say that they reached out across the country, so is the Food Recovery Network literally nationwide at this point? We are nationwide. We are we are represented um, by our, our higher education chapters. Gotcha. In 176 higher education institutions, okay, in 46 states, including here in DC, um, so we have about 4,000 students, alums, dining providers, oh um, partner agencies that receive the food um, in our network. Mm-hmm. And over the next 10 years, you know, when you're reading my bio, and thank you so yeah. much for that. Um, part of what we're working on is to. Um, grow that number from 4,000 people who are so committed to ensuring people get the food that they deserve to yes. 40,000 people wow. um, in, in the next 10 years. Okay. Okay. And do you guys have like a statistics, like a statistic of how much food you are recovering at this point? Mm-hmm. We do. So to date, we have recovered through the power of college students volunteering their time through the power of businesses doing the right thing with their food, we've recovered over um, 5.1 million pounds of food. Oh my goodness. And that translates into over 5 million meals to human beings that deserve that food. So this is, you know, people who are experiencing um, homelessness, um, domestic violence, veterans, people who are underemployed, um, not employed. There's so many reasons why sadly people don't have enough food to eat, but we're making sure through the, again, the power of these amazing mm-hmm. students that people get that food. Mm-hmm. Um, and so actually this past program year, um, even though it was the pandemic, even though we saw only about 50% of our students who were actually able to do recovery efforts, mm-hmm. we were able to recover over a million pounds of food. Wow. Um, and, mo- wow. and much of that was uh, fresh produce through a powerful partnership with the FarmLink project Shout out to them. Wow. This is also um, a, an organization that was cropped up because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also another student-driven uh, uh, organization, which we love because, again, the power of, of young people mm. to just blow things out of the water yep. and make things happen. 
So because of our powerful partnership with the Farmlink Project, we were able to recover a lot of fresh produce and to really get it into the communities that actually need that food. We, we've seen through, um, you know, Efron being a data-driven nonprofit that a, a lot of times, depending on where our chapters are, the food that we're recovering, yes, it is getting into um, places of need. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes those um, communities actually are, are doing okay in terms okay. of how they are able to feed the people who need, who need the food. So we're thinking about, okay, well, where's the next concentric circle? Yeah. Of, of communities that don't have the infrastructure, that don't have the limelight, that don't have, you know, a lot of the focus on them. You know, they're already doing so many amazing, incredible things to feed their neighbors in need. Um, so I want to shout out to all of those folks on the front lines that are really in those communities that have been disinvested in um, mm-hmm. to say, thank you for all that you do every single day to feed your, your community. And FRN would like to help support you um, to to increase that flow of precious food um, that everyone so deserves, and, there, so, and that that kind of takes that takes a little while, you know, to to get into those neighborhoods sometimes. Yeah, so we're talking like um, um, food desert areas, redlined areas, those types of, um, of. Is that what you're specifically targeting there in in what you've just said? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and you know, and again, thanks for reading my my background. You know, in terms of I've I've spent. My whole career, as you, as you mentioned, in the nonprofit sector, and and that you know has um, gone across a lot of different organizations, mm-hmm. including I worked for a very long time for an anti-poverty nonprofit, and you know a, a lot of what we did um, was to empower the people who happen to be in poverty to lift themselves out of poverty because it's mm-hmm. so it is very fractured system to try mm-hmm. to you know make your ends meet, um, and a lot of times people who live in a world where they've never had to worry about finances or they've never had to worry Mm -hmm. about food, they really truly, um, and this isn't an indictment, um, they've never really truly had to, you know, wonder, you know, why is it that people don't have these resources? Um, And so it's really educating people on, it's not a moral reason why people don't have the food that they need. It's not people consistently making bad choices, Mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and choosing the wrong path. If we have 42 million people who don't have enough food to eat, my goodness, that is not, they just didn't get it wrong. (laughs) There are other, there are other things at play here. And so, um, so redlining is, is definitely one of those things. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to say that we have the national association of realtors on our board of directors. Wow. So that we can begin to address some of the health outcomes and really shine a light on mm. when people have housing and they have secure housing and they have mm-hmm. safe housing, mm-hmm. how does that interact with their um, access to food? Um, we've had conversations before, and this is a learning journey for me okay. as well around okay. when we use words like, you know, food deserts, food apartheid, food swamps, um, you know, lots of people um, describe the situation of lack of access to, to food consistently Mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. And I, you know, I I thank everyone when they, when they correct me, you know, I say this all with like humility and out of respect. Um, you know, so at the end of the day though, (laughs) you know, why don't people have the ability to get food and get it fairly quickly without having to take three buses, Mm -hmm. um, which is expensive. And sometimes you just don't have the money to take those three buses Mm -hmm. to get to a grocery store. Um, and so that means you are going to different places, um, and getting, you know, maybe the food that's not as nutritious, but it's mm-hmm. available to you. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 um, I could, I could literally go on and on Diana, but, um, you know, it just, again, mm-hmm. just, just helping, helping people widening their aperture of understanding as to how did we get to this place that we are in right now of 42 million people not having enough food to eat mm-hmm. and then letting folks understand that we can all have a role to play in correcting that, in amending mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Um, system so that we can, you know, make everyone whole. Right. I, I That's like a whole um, webinar series. I think we could probably, <laughs> right? Let's do I, it. Um, and then, and it's so hard because sometimes we can even get lost in the, how did we get here? Because going backwards isn't how we're going to get out of it. So we kind of, we want to understand how we got here, but we now have all sorts of tools available to us to literally, literally eradicate this scenario. Yes. So 
when you're thinking about this, I'm hearing food service, I'm hearing hospitality. Um, how are you working with CPG brands or are you yet in your efforts? And please um, do illuminate and educate me, CPG yeah. brands. Consumer packaged goods. So products <laughs> that you buy at retail. Yes. yes. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. You know, I will say, um, it, it, thinking again about the, the anniversary that FRN is embarking on, you know, being around for, for 10 years, we, we do see a lot of just real quick, you know, speaking of packaged brands, a lot of really cool companies that are um, coming up that are, are using, um, you know, surplus food or, 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 you know, parts of food that uh, might not have been consumed Mm -hmm. um, to um, further contribute to um, the amount of food that we have for people to to eat. And, and I do want to give a shout out to matriarch foods um, for their work. Um, Mm -hmm. Incredible. But in terms of, um, you know, consumer packaged goods, you know, we have seen with the pandemic that actually a lot of our higher education institutions are moving to these grab and go, um, mm-hmm. you know, situations. Um, and, and it's all, you know, we are prepared to recover any, any kind of food, Anything. you know, okay. and, and we already started with the hardest part, which is prepared mm-hmm. foods. You know, so this is yes. food that was hot or was cold, yes. keeping it at temperature. So, you know, when we think about um, packaged foods, um, you know, we, we are equally prepared to recover that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we do lend our voice to um, legislation that is out around, okay. um, you know, date labeling. So some of these packaged oh. goods, it's very confusing to people as to, is. is this still okay and safe for me and my family yeah. to eat? So we're trying to, you know, make that easier for people to make decisions about, yes. you know, the food that they have um, so that we're not necessarily unnecessarily throwing away perfectly good food and yeah. that grocery stores aren't pulling perfectly good food before they need to. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but consumer packaged goods is, um, you know, a really great way for, um, you know, in terms of shelf life yes. for some of the um, nonprofits where we do- donate the food to, to uh, you know, because not everybody has a stove, not everybody right. has a microwave, yep. not everyone has the ability to, yep. you know, keep fresh foods fresh. Yep. Yep. Um, and so we just, it's all about dignity, respect, and getting yes. the right kinds of foods to yes. the people that need it. Yes. I'm working on a personal project right now in school where we're working with, well, haven't started the project yet, so I don't want to disclose who it is, but we're working with an organization that is getting people that is I'm dealing with transitional housing. So um, temporary housing, getting those skills getting those items that they need and moving into permanent housing. And the biggest challenge we have there is not all of these living situations allow for food preparation. And so there is a need for either meals delivered or consumer packaged products that are heat and eat microwave, but Mm -hmm. have a nutritional value to them because um, the other uh, element is some of these folks, b- depending on why they became homeless in the first place, may not even have some of the food prep skills. A microwave is going to be yep. their primary for a long time yep. in that meantime. So I think, uh, you know, it sounds like you guys are kind of on the front end of could possibly be a resource for brands that are wanting to create uh, brands uh, recovering uh, produce uh, and other kind of food, but then also could uh, help be use you as a conduit rather than creating a whole separate entity to move yes. product um, and even educate, like even education, because as we have found in the and the work that we've been doing, the retail voodoo does, is that most adults get their education through marketing and advertising unless they're actively seeking it out. If your group, your audience that you've decided doesn't fit your target, doesn't fit your target audience, mm, let's, let me say that a different way. In naturals, our target audience are wealthy, mm-hmm. educated, and typically Caucasian. And so we don't market to traditionally to people that are outside of that. It's changing. Yes, it is. But we're not educating down here. And so 
if you can't educate, if you're not educating, they're never going to learn to continue that cycle based off of Mm -hmm. what we, what we believe is happening and what is not happening. So lots to unpack there. I think your organization can be a conduit of um, education for consumer packaged brands to be either a better partner or to help better plan, even just work in their own communities. It sounds like. We are definitely um, trying to do just that, Diana. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have a lot of resources um, to have those kinds of conversations and actually do that work. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I just first, though, want to say thank you for what you're doing with the transitional housing organization. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear more Mm -hmm. about that when it's when it's time. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I, uh, that I tell folks, uh, 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 you, you know, again, the, the poor people's campaign, they, they will, th- their numbers are 120 million Americans living in poverty. Mm-hmm. Again, they're not all just getting that wrong. No. The other part within that is just, as you said, when we think about people who are um, poor and um, living in poverty, there's a lot of assumptions that go along with that. And you hit on one of them, which is that they don't have any money. Mm-hmm. And that is absolutely not true. Mm-hmm. Um, there, the money flow comes in fits and stops. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that really does alter your ability for purchasing power for sure. Mm-hmm. So now instead of getting, you know, that bulk, you know, toilet paper, you're just getting yep. the one-off, 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 right, and you're right. just actually spending a lot more money mm-hmm. um, than you, than you would if you, if you again had, had the means to make your, your full circle mm-hmm. meet. Um, and so I think a lot of banks are realizing that there's a lot of money to, to be you yep. know captured. Um, I think again, with the National Association of Realtors, we understand what, you know, the, the benefits of our communities when we yep. are able to like get people into, you know, permanent housing, um, and, and so there is a lot of myth busting, mm-hmm. you know, that I, I, I feel personally passionate about, and I'm just, again, so thankful for the work that you're, you're doing. I think another group too, um, within that, um, is folks that are aging out of the foster care system, yes. um, in terms of, you know, w- what kinds of resources they have to prepare food and the mm-hmm. knowledge base that they have. Mm-hmm. Um, it's another very vulnerable group of people that um, I think probably are in a lot of the transitional housing, um, you know, work that you're, that you're doing. Yes. I will share more. You'll, you'll hear more in about three or four months. Awesome. (laughs) So exciting. Well, so tell me, tell me a little bit about what, or tell us a little bit about what, what are your biggest challenges right now? What is the food recovery network challenged with either finding or delivering on? I'll, I'll talk about it from two different altitudes. Okay. The first, I have to talk about it from the altitude of the executive director. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so I've been, I've been at Efren for uh, six years and um, it's my first time being an executive director and it was a goal. It was a huge goal of mine. Okay. Um, Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, when I first started at, at, at FRN, our budget was about $425,000. And now we are a, a $1 million organization. We just eked over, um, you know. Nice. The, thank you. Yeah. So we're really, we're really very proud of that. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, have told me like, that's huge. You've been able to do that so quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't a, you know, a very highly networked person. You know, I don't call up, you know, people in the administration to get, you know, like a $600,000 grant or anything yep. like that. You know, it was very much just grinding it out. Mm-hmm. And I, I love to do that. I have no problem asking people to make financial contributions to FRN because I believe in what we're doing. And we are very, um, responsible stewards of the finances that we do receive. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, <laughs> I will say, you know, for me, it has felt like the, it has felt like incremental growth. Yeah. Um, and so a challenge that I have is I have proven um, that we are financial stewards. I have proven the model of FRN. I've, you know, and when I say I, it is my, it is a team, yes. you know, it's not just Regina alone. Um, we work as a, as a unit and it's a, awesome unit. I love my team. Um, you know, we have proven ourselves time and time again. We, most of the time, if we set a goal, we, uh, 
we surpass it. Um, and so I find a challenge for me is I am ready for FRN to um, be able to partner with organizations, you know, foundations or corporations that can provide a larger gift than what we historically have been given. And this is a challenge, I think, of a lot of nonprofits, yeah. but you know, Efron is not unique in that way. I just happen to have the mic. <laughs> and I happen to say that that has been a challenge. And and statistically, though, I, I you know, we can put it on paper in terms of what it means to be a, a, a woman, a, a brown person, you know, leading a, a nonprofit. And the stats are very different mm-hmm. for, you know, mm-hmm. for me um, than it is for, you know, other other kinds of groups of people who are running running nonprofits. So I want, I'm ready. So that's a challenge. Um, and one that I welcome, you know, deep partnerships that um, provide the kind of resources that FRN needs to feed more people faster. We have a framework that we've been working on. We just mm-hmm. recently um, uh, put forward our, our, our learnings, our results, mm-hmm. um, and asked for people's feedback as mm-hmm. we begin to make adjustments as we mm-hmm. go up this mountaintop of mm-hmm. um, securing the, you know, the economic sec- security of the 42 million people who are food insecure. Um, so that is a challenge and one that, you know, I, I live it every single day and there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs, Mm -hmm. um, in terms of another altitude programmatically, um, yes, we, we are, um, some of the challenges are that we, that we faced, um, that we, we, we're a learning organization, we're data driven, but we learn and we, you know, take that learning and apply it very quickly, We've, we've done um, some pilots actually out in Atlanta with powerful partnerships with the EPA and the, the mayor's office. So shout out to them and thank okay. you so much for what you've been able to do. Now, when I was mentioning earlier about really getting into the communities that actually are like, please, we need your help. We need your yes. resources. Um, yes. Challenges are, you know, how to begin to build the infrastructure, how to identify, you know, because a lot of us, if, if, if we if we don't challenge ourselves and in mm-hmm. our framework that I just mentioned, it's, mm-hmm. it's an equity based framework, yes. mm-hmm. you know, equity is at the center. Um, and so we can't just leave it at like, okay, here's a food bank. They probably need the food that we have available. Right. They might, they might not, they actually yes. might be doing a okay. Yeah. So let's think about who else is out there that mm-hmm. doesn't always get that email to say like, Hey, there's an organization that has extra right. food. You need it. Right. And thanks to the the partnership with the mayor's office out in Atlanta, we were able to identify those groups, those very groups, because they live there, you know, right. They have those. So, so, so identifying those kinds of partnerships that are actually going to roll up their sleeves and do that work with us Mm -hmm. um, is a beautiful challenge. um, And one that, you know, as we look to expand Mm -hmm. that um, gleaning pilot, um, we will continue to do to to need more of that. Um, Okay. And just in case, I'm not sure, I, I would have, I don't want to assume that your amazing audience um, knows the term gleaning because I know a lot of people in my world I, do, I don't. Do, don't. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Okay. So gleaning is when we go to a farm field after harvest. So after the farmers have gone through and, and picked all the things either by machine or by hand. Okay. So again, shout out to all of our um, you know, uh, fa- farm hands that are yes. you know, manually picking our strawberries and doing yes. all this. Um, thank you very much in, in doing that in times of COVID. Sometimes there is extra, um, there's still food on, on the farm field, it, either because mm-hmm. it's too ripe, not ripe enough, too mm-hmm. big, lots of different reasons. Or, you know, hey, the farmer just, things were, all the ingredients were really great and more produce was was um, grown than, than there was, was a needed. need for, yep, okay. than there was a contract for. So um, gleaning is then going out, back out after that, that initial harvest and collecting the um, produce that is still on the farm field so that mm-hmm. it doesn't get tilled under. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we are able to transport that um, food um, that would have gotten tilled under. And we do bring that to our, our food banks, our homeless shelters. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, huh. it's been an awesome um, pilot. And a lot of our chapters, they on their own, um, they, they go out and glean, you know, especially at Florida and California yes. chapters. Yes. Um, it's it's a wonderful way to get that healthy produce to um into our communities. Yes. That's that's there's a lot there. There's a lot happening in Washington state as well. I'm sure you're probably aware of Fair Start and uh the work that they're doing using 
I don't know if you're familiar with Fair Start, but they use people who are transitioning out of homelessness and teaching them trade skills to work in restaurants and food preparation and service and delivery. And then they have a restaurant where people like myself can come and eat. But during COVID, when the restaurant shut down, they looked at their business model and said, we're going to start creating packaged and we're going to deliver. So they are delivering out into areas where there have been big needs, including the school districts. The Seattle Public School Districts received food packaged meals for anyone, regardless of need, that you wouldn't have a need at all. But these amazingly prepared meals um, by people who are transitioning out of homelessness delivered to neighborhoods and to areas of need. It's really quite outstanding how as an organization gains momentum, the impact that it can have. So I can see how, um, how you guys are at least, at least in the markets that are not like Seattle, some markets are moving ahead faster because sure. there's an appetite for that type of support mechanism, um, a safety net structures versus other areas. But I, I can appreciate the complexity and the need states of trying to communicate in the needs and the production and the transport. And it's, it's tough. And then thinking that you're going all the way down to the field, mm-hmm. like that's a big deal that we're not just recovering food off the shelf. We are recovering it from the entire food chain process exactly. is pretty great. That's, I, I have, um, I love that model and I'm so thankful that they were able to um, be so creative mm-hmm. um, during, you know, these unprecedented times, mm-hmm. um, challenging times. Um, there's again, I'm yet to use your phrase. There's so much to pull out from what you just said. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just um, thinking of a like-minded organization called Delancey Street Foundation in San Francisco, uh-huh. a very similar model where they have a restaurant mm-hmm. um, that um, people who um, were experiencing homelessness can come and learn all of the different um, roles within that yes. restaurant. Um, and what I love about them um, is that they also have a barbershop. So they teach people how to, you know, cut hair. Oh, hey. Um, yep. They have a, um, a mechanic shop. Um, so they teach people how to be mechanics and they have a trucking um, situation. So they then teach people how to um, drive the truck. So, and if the trucks happen to need mechanical um, support, then people mm-hmm. are being trained on how to fix mm-hmm. those, those cars. And we partnered with them for three years in a row. And again, unfortunately due to COVID, we weren't able to partner because the event with which we partnered, it's called the winter fancy food show. Um, yes. Thanks to specialty food association. Yes. I'm sure it sounds very familiar in, in the line of work that you do. And so we would come in after that winter fancy food show, which is a trade show um of of you know companies all around the world displaying their their food offerings mm-hmm. and that at the end of the show you know these are full sized samples um yes. either got shipped back which yep. is a lot of waste of natural resources right. abandoned completely and thrown away so we'd come through and you know ask people if they would be willing to donate their product yes. that they might have left over we took all of that you know, year after year, 35,000 pounds of food, 27,000 pounds of food the first, you know, year. And we were able to donate it all to Delancey Street Foundation. Love it. And because they have truck drivers, people yep. know how to drive the trucks, they were able to come grab yes. the food. It was gorgeous. It was a beautiful, wonderful situation. Oh my gosh. We'll do it again as soon as, you know, things like that yes. are possible. Well, Ex- Expo East is happening still, yes. question mark. I'm okay. not sure. I mean, that, that's what they're saying. We're watching the COVID numbers um, creep up rather dramatically mm-hmm. in Philly. So we'll see if that sticks. But for now, there are still organizations that are ha- holding food shows. So um, I know you stretched thin with an organization your size to hit everybody up might be tough, but... Well, yeah. I want to um, just for a moment, step back and learn about the Regina that like Regina's journey to this, like we definitely hear your passion <laughs> and I love what you're doing. How'd you get here? Why, why here? How'd you get here? Is this something you've been wanting to do your whole life? Well, you know, I'm very um, thankful and um, I feel like I'm doing what I'm should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's been very recent that I have 
really began to talk about my background. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I would talk about my, um, when I was in undergrad, my exposure to learning about AmeriCorps, Mm -hmm. which was, you know, really what jumpstarted my even understanding what the nonprofit sector was and that Mm -hmm. you can have a career in helping Mm -hmm. people. But I always omitted a particular fact about, you know, who, who I am that I am now just like, I guess, leaning into because it is the reason why I do the work that I do, which is I, I grew up in a working poor household mm. um, and it was pretty stressful for my parents. They worked shift work um, and it was just never going to be enough. It was just mm-hmm. never going to be enough. They yeah. did double shifts. They worked seven days a week a lot of times um, or, you know, just had a day off you know, here and there. Um, and it just was never enough, you know, mm-hmm. and it, and again, if anybody has ever, and I don't want anybody to ever experience this, but for right. those of us who have, you know what it's like where you pause on paying this bill so that you can do something over here, which might be get yeah. your kids, you know, clothes because they've outgrown all their clothes, or it might be, mm-hmm. you know, taking your kid to the dentist because, you know, whatever it might be, you're always just sort of playing this, this board game of, yes life and it is extremely stressful um and while I was able to go to college uh, you know I my sister and I were the first in our immediate family um to to go to college I didn't really know what that was like I didn't know I didn't you know have a vision for how that was going to improve my life Mm -hmm. um but I just happened to be um a, a a person who can you know stick to long term ideas Mm -hmm. Um, and I graduated, um, but I, I, I all through college and, and, you know, into my mid twenties, I, I too was a pretty much working poor individual. Mm -hmm. And so then I inherited a lot of the stress of like, you know, trying to make all these things happen. And along the way, um, I just had so many people who helped me, um, from my professors at undergrad who encouraged me to get an internship. And I, and I went on to one of my first jobs that I have is to help other people find internships um, to, you know, my best friend's family growing up that, you know, just really encouraged me. They're the ones to say, like, what are you doing? You're going to college because I hadn't even right. you know thought about that um, to, you know, after grad school, um, when I was like looking for, you know, my next steps, this t- all, all the way down to this, there was this particular um, uh, group of people that would come in every once in a while. Um, to the restaurant where I was waiting tables and they were just lovely human beings and say their bill happened to be, you know, 75 bucks across six people. Sure. They would basically leave me a tip of $150. And then just, you know, and whenever they came, I wasn't expecting that at all, but they have no idea how many times they saved me. They have no idea how many times they saved me. And so I just, all the ingredients, all of this like life experience and setback and hardship and gems and, you know, all of these things just is an inextinguishable fire inside of me that I'm here to ensure that people don't have to deal with this kind of crap. (laughs) There's no other way to put it. It's just ridiculous. It's a huge waste of time. There's so much cortisol coursing through our veins. You know, I, how many times have I woken up in the middle of the night just stressed out of my mind about money. Yes. You know, and I'm working really hard. People are working really Really hard. hard. And in exchange, you know, we, 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 as a, as a nation could at least say, well, through, thank you for that. We can guarantee you have a safe place to lay your head and you can, you know, bring your kids to school. And there's very, it's very simple things that we ask for in return. And um, I'm indignant that, that's not being returned back to so many people who are working so hard. Yeah. It's, it's a little crazy when you think about it because the, the, some of the same people who say, well, those that are living in poverty um, made bad choices. And yet if you look at many of the people that are working in poverty, they oftentimes are working harder yeah. Than the than the person who's thinking that through, they're not thinking, oh, it, they've got two jobs and um, they don't have discretionary income, so they can't do an Instacart. And grocery shopping is a two-hour event. Um, and um, if time is money, 
And there, you know, you start to compound that thinking. And there was something that you said when we were preparing for this call that like, and I don't want to turn this into like a, a political type of, uh, of concept. So if I'm hoping that people can hear this not as a political, but more kind of a functional type of thing. But capitalism, you said, is designed for there to be winners and losers. If I, if I was to articulate it in shorthand, where the winners get to be winners and they feel good about winning because they can look down and see that there's losers. I think that's starting to shift depending on where you live. Like for example, here where I live in Seattle, there are huge pockets of people that are um, hide hide their resources, not because they're afraid it's going to be stolen, but there's almost a little bit of embarrassment in their mm. success. And it would be nice for us to be like, you can be successful and you can make loads of money, but make sure you're taking care of like mm-hmm. that. This is not a winner take all. This is a, because you have, therefore you can type of scenario. Uh, and um, that can get into all sorts of prickliness um, from a political standpoint. But if we're just talking economically, if we're just mm-hmm. talking about humans we can all say there could be a different way for us to be handling all of this. It doesn't have to be this way. I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I I think you articulated that um, very adroitly. And I, I agree with you you to the point where, um, you know, when we do our work, as I was mentioning, you know, with, this is what equity means to me. Mm. When we were um, working on our pilot in Atlanta, when we were finally able to identify a farmer, because that, again, that took a little while, Mm -hmm. we reached out to a lot of farmers and they're busy, Mm. um, you know, but the farmer, they're working, (laughs) they're not on on their computers like we are, you know, like, um, but the farmer, farmer Mike that we are able to begin our partnership with, um, he, we, we paid him a living wage to you know, harvest the food and transport mm. the food. We weren't mm. asking them to donate that because mm. farmers are already living, you know, living in such tight margins. Mm. We want to be able to pay for the services. Mm. People want to be able to buy their food. That's the number one way people get their food. It's not mm. donated to them. They buy it. Right. You know, and we don't want it to be like, well, you can buy your food, but you can't buy your medication or right. whatever it might be, you know? So that's what that, when you, you know, your, your call to, to equity, that's what that looks like. You know, that we're paying our farmers a living wage. Um, and that when they do have surplus food, we're not trying to necessarily nickel and dime them right? so that it's not even worth it to them. Um, donations are amazing whenever we can get those because it really does help in this extraordinary time of need right now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we definitely take donations, but um, we can also begin the system of, you know, trying to pay people for their time, for their expertise, for the thing that they produce. And this, you know, happens to be broccoli Mm. or tomatoes or Mm. or whatever it is. Um, And I think, you know, no matter where you stand, you know, you, we can all agree, agree to that, you know? And, and so um, the other thing too, about, you know, food recovery is that I, I, I think another thing that we can all agree on is everyone has the right to food. Yeah. And I don't care, you know, what your politics are. This isn't about, it's not about politics. It's about being a human being mm-hmm. and ensuring that people aren't suffering. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, that, and, that's, and that's it. It's pretty simple. Well, I, I can appreciate your, your personal story. And I thank you for sharing that with us because I know that that's, um, you know, that's a tough thing to share with strangers. It's not easy. It's not easy. But well, I feel like I should. So yeah. Thank you for creating that safe space for me to yeah. do that. Yeah. I wonder at what point did you have an aha in this postgraduate world where you said, I'm on a mission? Was it in that moment when you were serving tables and and getting those tips from those uh, amazing people? Or was there something or was it a series of some things? It was a, it was a series of some things I had um, after, after I graduated, um, where I went to Carnegie Mellon for grad school okay. and I, and I studied race and gender theory and systems of power. Okay. Ah, so <laughs> there was that, you know, and I was, I was fascinated by that because of how I grew up, you mm. know? So sometimes we, we, we turn in and we're reflective on, you know, 
our, our pursuits. So it's very, yes. I mean, the dots are very much connected there. Yes. <laughs> and then I, you know, I, I waited tables for about seven, nine months for the, the family that I, that owned the restaurant. I love them. You know, mm-hmm. when I go back to Pittsburgh, I, you know, try to still visit them. Um, it, they were wonderful. And I learned a lot of, of things while waiting tables. You know, it's a really great gig to have in terms of, you know, being able to manage all kinds of different relationships yes. in your time. And, you know, yes. it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, but then my first job out of, um, you know, out of that was at the Coral Center for Civic Leadership and okay. it's an individual leadership development organization. So that was a key piece for me. I worked there for five years. Um, and uh, so I got like a ton of, of training, ex- accelerated training on how to organize yourself, um, how to organize your time, how to organize teams. Um, how to, you know, look out into the community to gather resources that you might need. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also partnered with um, an AmeriCorps um, organization pro- project okay. called Public Allies. And so they're the group that did a lot of reflection around, um, you know, race and who gets to be a leader and who's at the table. And, you know, how do you build your own table if you're not invited to a particular table? So all of those things were swirling around me. And at the same time, I'm very poor still. Um, so I'm volunteering a lot, um, because I'm an extrovert. I just love, you know, all these different things. My friends are very active, you know, so that was like the ecosystem that I was in, Mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh. And so I couldn't afford to go to all these awesome gals and stuff. So I just volunteered to, you know, work the registration table, which is the best because you get to talk to every single person. Right. Love it. Um, and then over time, you know, people, um, started asking me to join committees, um, and I started joining boards. Um, so another big swirl for me was that I, I joined um, two particular um, nonprofit boards. And I was on a bunch that were just awesome. Yeah. But these two in particular um, were, were women, um, you know, shout out to, to Kim Everett and Christine Haas, where I was able to just observe how they, how they led their organizations. And mm-hmm. I was able to take some good things from them, some very good things, because up until that point, you know, you think about, does your boss inspire you? Do you get along with your, you know, and I hadn't necessarily had that. Again, mm-hmm. my time at Coral was amazing, but, you know, truly, truly, truly making things like click for me was these, these two women. So all of that, you know, came to be for me where things started to make a pathway of, um, I, th- I feel more and more confident in my ability to see a long-term vision come into life, um, not today, not tomorrow, and not in, um, you know, necessarily a year. And I have to say, when you grow up poor and you're thinking about even a simple concept of, I just don't want to be poor anymore, how are you going to do that right. in a fractured system? It takes years. And so I'm an extremely patient person. <laughs> I'm an extremely patient person when it comes to, I will harness um, what I see in the future that I know that other people agree on should be the future. I will yep. harness that because soon that future is the today. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how that all kind of happened for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I think I, it's, it's kind of a crazy question where I say, where I ask, what's that one moment? Because it's really never a one moment. It's, it, the one moment is really a tipping point, a mm-hmm. series of events. So I, I get that. I want to ask a little bit. There was something that you and I also talked about when we were discussing, when we were preparing for this. And it was talking about the diversity gap within organizations, it, mm-hmm. specifically in leadership within organization, like the Food Recovery Network. Mm-hmm. And you had an insight there on how it impacts the people that you serve. Um, so, so sorry, I was trying to adjust. I, I realized, let me just do a human moment right now and yep. try to adjust my lighting so that I'm not just a big, you know, glaring <laughs> thing for, for everyone um, listening in. You're good. Could you, could you say that one one more time in terms sure. of sure? Yeah, so the question sure. th- here's the question: When we were preparing for this call, you had made a statement about the the diversity 
disparity Mm -hmm. in organizations like the Food Recovery Mm -hmm. Network, particularly at a leadership level. Mm -hmm. And you had an insight on how it impacts the communities that you serve. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you, I don't know if you remember. I do. Yeah. It's, it's something that I feel like is very, um, again, a, a passion of mine that I, not only is it a lived experience, but I'm also a big nerd. And so I study this stuff academically. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just really fun. And I tell my team this all the time, like what angle do we want here? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. you know, um, so a few things that I'll say and yeah. just to lay the groundwork. And the first is that I think, you know, in our attempts at diversity, we create these checks boxes that we need to, yes. you know, um, and, and I think for a lot of organizations, maybe that's a good start. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's also this flatulation that happens. So you're just always sort of beating yourself up for never having all those boxes checked. Yes. Why would you, you know, people leave your team or they leave, you know, your, your volunteer opportunity, other people come in and it's always swirling around. Mm-hmm. And, and so what, what I, I'm looking for is what does, you know, inclusion look like? Mm -hmm. So right now at Afrin, I talk to the team about this all the time. You know, they're, uh, you know, I identify as Brown or multiracial. We Mm -hmm. have somebody who identifies as Latina and everyone else identifies as white. And, and then we talk about this very upfront, Mm -hmm. you know, that I want people when they come, if they're considering working at Afrin or if they're considering volunteering at Afrin, that they could be the only one who, whatever identifier you want to say. Mm -hmm. And I still feel like I am welcomed here. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I don't want to do the emotional labor of explaining to people X identifier, I don't have to, Yeah, you know, that's, that's really important to me. And, and so we do see, you know, again, I, I really appreciated what you said, Diana, about, we don't always need to do the, you know, let's go all the way back into history to understand how we got there to, to, to where we are today. But when we think about some certain um, opportunities, Mm -hmm. um, volunteering being one of them, Mm -hmm. um, it is oftentimes, you know, what you do when you have spare time. And if you're working three jobs and you are trying to go to school and raise a family, you might not necessarily have that free time. Shout out to the University of the District of Columbia um, students who participated in our national conference a few years ago, you know, single moms, students, you know, trying to make their own ends meet and um, created a food pantry at that you know institution. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying that you know just because you might um, be really struggling um, unnecessarily due to bigger structures outside of your control that you don't volunteer. That's that's not it at all. Right. Um, but sometimes it is more amenable to be able to do something like volunteer. Um, it is more amenable to do something like go on to higher education yes. if your parents have done it if they're able to, you know, pay for it or even, you know, pay for whatever their financial contribution is. And then suddenly it's like, okay, well, we look around who are our friends. They kind of all have the shared experience. So when I mentioned about how FRN first started, it was literally people calling their other friends at higher education institutions, you know? So for me, that also means, okay, who are we, um, who are we not talking to? Right. Right. Or right. who's trying to talk to us and maybe we're not listening. Yes. Um, and so it just behooves me to ensure that I'm not trying to check boxes, just to check boxes, but it behooves me to understand, you know, authentically the needs of people across the country when it comes to food, when it comes to what they're already doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's for me how we can start to begin to be more asset based as opposed to these folks weren't at the table. Now they want to be at the table. And that means something bad for me. Yeah. That means something's being taken away from me. No, it yeah. is actually one plus one can equal five. It really can. Mm. Um, and so that. it's moving away from that, you know, scarcity mindset of when we think about widening the circle for more people, our, our, our knee jerk reaction isn't to shut the door because mm-hmm. something's going to be taken away from us. That's, mm-hmm. that's not, that's not, that's not what's going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. Mm. Well, when, wh- when you think about your journey to where you are now and the work that you do, what kind of advice do you like to give people who are considering a similar path or similar work? What do you like to tell them? 
So I love, thank you for that question. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, um, as I mentioned, I, I love young people. Mm-hmm. I love, you know, this, you know, 18 to whatever year old, mm-hmm. you know, on up, um, mm-hmm. just find it's such a fascinating and fun time in life. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, the sky is the limit and I want to make sure that we keep it that way. You yes. know, I don't want to, I don't want, you know, people always say when you get older, then, oh, you know, you're all in your joy and you're, you know, no, let's keep that. Let's keep it. Let's keep yes. those ideas going, yes, you know, ma'am. right. Um, so I, um, I, the advice that I give folks is a few, is a few things. Try a lot of stuff. And I know that that, you know, people are now doing internships when they're like, you know, junior high. Um, but try a lot of stuff and, um, don't assume that because you have your first job out of college, that it's going to be the right fit for you. Mm. You know, over, over time, I've seen a lot of people who are just very, um, not happy in their jobs or in their fellowship, mm-hmm. you know, it's, that's happened at a friend. They're just not happy there because it's mm-hmm. not a good fit, mm-hmm. but you don't know that until you try it. Yep. Yep. And then, and then once you realize what is it about this that I don't like, is it the people or is mm-hmm. it the responsibilities or mm-hmm. the lack of responsibilities mm-hmm. really drill down on what is it? And then, you know, move on to the next thing where, mm-hmm. you know, stay for a year if you can, you know, but just, Let's not assume that if you're feeling unsatisfied, that it is, you know, somebody's doing something to you. Yes. Um, and, and I think that has, I think that can help. Yep. So that people aren't just like, I don't want to see people leaving the nonprofit sector because it doesn't, yep. one job doesn't feel like a good, yep. a, a good fit. And I will say, you know, we know that um, before the pandemic, the nonprofit sector was seeing a lot of people entering into that sector because so many people, you know, at the end of the day, um, want to make a difference in the work in which they endeavor. Mm -hmm. Um, so I say, thanks, we need all the help we can get. We Mm -hmm. need all the talent that, that we can get. Um, Mm -hmm. so please come join us in the, in the nonprofit space. Um, but yeah. Is that the same advice that you would give the, the Regina in college? That, not, no one's ever asked me that. Oh, I love it. Um, I guess, Try, that, you know, cause I, this is where it's coming from because I'm thinking yeah. the person that comes from lack of mm-hmm. trial and error is not part of the lexicon or the behavior. So no. what would you tell the Regina that might be different than what you just said? Cause I feel like it might be different. Yeah, I, I will say you're, you, you're absolutely right, Diana. I, I, my margin of making mistakes was very small. Mm-hmm. There's no room. There's, There's no, no room. room at that, it, it, at that place. Mm-mm. And it's impossible to not make mistakes as a human being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I will say before I answer that question, I, I feel I'm very lucky that I, I made a lot of mistakes. There were mm-hmm. some classes that I so I didn't know how to approach college. I mean, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people don't, even if yeah. your parents go out to college or grandparents yeah. or whatnot. Um, but uh, you know, I just I just wasn't sure how to how to do this thing. So you know, I had some classes that I didn't like, and I didn't know how to like drop a class, you know, add a class. Um, you know, so mistakes definitely were made, and I guess, and I walked away from that still not being a perfectionist. <laughs> Are That's you a another, perfectionist now? No. Oh, okay. I was going to sign me up nope. for that class. There's no such thing. <laughs> and that's not how we get our work done. And so I will say that's more advice I would give to other people is mm-hmm. perfection is not mm-hmm. the goal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is not. When, when we're walking up that mountain together and mm-hmm. there's so many different ways to do the same thing, mm-hmm. you know, so let yourself off the hook a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, perfection is not. Mm-hmm. Um, so the advice that I would, that I would give myself, you know, as a young Regina, I think would be, you know, when I, when I talk about the mistakes, you know, you have to be so good with your money. You have to be so good with your money. And if you're really good with your money, then you get a flat tire and there's no money for that. Or if you, you know, whatever it might be. So I think that I would say, um, within all that, it's, it sounds kind of draconian to know that not everything is within the scope of your control. Yeah. You know, if you have to go to a dentist and you don't have dental insurance and, oh, that's 400 bucks for this or that, yep. 
Um, I, I think I would say um, my advice would be to learn a bit more about finances. Okay. Um, it's something that my parents didn't talk about. Okay. They probably, you know, just when you don't have a lot, it's not, it's not like a common conversation right. that, you know, families have. So I think it would be, it definitely would be that. And I think there's more financial literacy that's happening at younger yes. ages. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and I'm just so thankful to, to know that that's happening, but okay. um, yeah, I think that would be it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Kind of boring, but no, it's <laughs> practical though. Like mm-hmm. if you, if there is a foundational element that you don't have, that is going to, and it's a, and it's a simple foundational element that's going to, that's going to be able to catapult you. Why yeah. wouldn't you want to have that bit of information? It could yes. be boring as sin. I mean, you got it. it. It's just all there is to it. Right. So, so okay. True. Check the box, yep. get some, get some basic financial literacy and libraries are doing that type of thing for love, free right now. Yep. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Well, Ms. Regina, our time is almost up. There's a few questions that I like to ask everybody. <laughs> um, so, well, these, and these are pretty quick, but um, there are, they typically are the fun part. So you've already given us some interesting facts about food, food recovery, uh, people living in poverty. Is there some sort of, I call it a happy hour fact, something that um, when you share it with people who are outside of our industry, whether it's in nonprofit or in food production and food manufacturing, that when you tell them, they're like, oh my, I had no idea. This is like super huge. Do you have a happy hour fact? Um, I guess I would say uh, a good, ha- that's an awesome way to put that too. Um, a happy hour fact is, um, you know, I, I think that when people understand, when, when, we, when I tell people what we do, Mm-hmm. They're, they're always like, I always wondered what happened to, you know, this extra food. And mm-hmm. I'm so glad that there's a, a place to put it, you know, th- there's, there's, there's people who need that food. So I think, a, you know, a happy hour fact is, you know, it's very simple to be part of a, a solution. Um, and so while the issue might seem very big, mm-hmm. um, I always tell people, and you can do something today. Mm-hmm. It's in it. And I think that that's really fun. So if we think about the, the most common statistic that we put out there is that 40% of the food that we produce mm-hmm. at some t- you know, time in the, in the food chain, it's going to not be eaten. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that number is, is changing, um, you know, thanks to the refeds of the world and the natural, ref- uh, natural resources defense council. Woo! Yes. Um, oh, NRDC for mm-hmm. short, um, <laughs> you know, they're doing a lot of this, you know, uh, you know, national research to help, um, you know, get a better um, understanding of that since that that statistic was first right, was right. first um, put out. So, um, you know, I think that you said it earlier. Truly, we can eradicate this um, human designed problem that we have here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. Are there any um, women leaders uh, in food, food production, or just in general that? you would like to just rising stars or just leaders in general that you would just like to acknowledge or um, simply admire for the work that they're doing and, and who are, and, and why? Oh, I love that question. And c- gosh, do we have 15 more hours? Um, <laughs> I do. I love naming names. I drop names all the time. And all right. you know, that, that is just, I love, I love that when we can do it for a good reason. <laughs> Um, so a couple of the names that come to my mind, um, I have to give a shout out to one of my dear friends, a super close friend of mine, Danielle Nuremberg, okay. who is the founder of Food Tank, a co-founder of Food Tank with okay. um, Bernie. Um, yeah, so they um, are an aggregate organization. Mm-hmm. So, and they started, um, uh, you know, even before um, FRN started, I believe. Mm-hmm. And I just joined their board of directors. Um, but it was a space to help people to, you know, gain knowledge when it was really hard to get information about well, who are farmers, you yes. know, where do they live and like, what are, what is soil amendment and, mm-hmm. you know, how are young people, you know, um, really thinking differently about food and, you know, what are some of the ways that we're, um, you know, saving water and growing more food, mm-hmm. you know, so Food Tank does all of that and they have a really beautiful focus on giving the mic to people who don't normally get the mic. And I think that's amazing. Um, So, so there's that, Um, you know, I just mentioned this stat, the 40%. Um, Dana Gunders, formerly of 
um, NRDC, now the executive director of Refed. Um, okay. And somebody who is, I just think, such a smart brain um, had been on our um, uh, advisory board. Um, Refed is still on the advisory board, but yes. you know, Dana is just such a, is a smart person. Um, I, I love her so much. Um, I need to give a shout out to Katie Jones, my chief operating officer. Um, you know, you know, Katie and I have known each other for a very long time and, um, we complement each other so well, you know, I'm mega extrovert, you know, I'm thinking, you know, 15 years down the line and she's Mm -hmm. like, great, let's do that. What do we need to do today? Yeah. Um, You know, and just (laughs) has transformed FRN, has transformed FRN. And I'm just so thankful that she Mm. joined the team about a year and a half ago. I haven't looked back since, and it really has helped to accelerate us achieving our goals. Um, and you know, the FRN team, we're all, we all identify as, as women. Um, we have one person on our team who identifies as male. So if I could just give a full shout out to the, to the FRN team, um, you know, and, and all of our, our, our students, 71% of the people who volunteer at FRN are, are women or identify as, as female. Um, so truly we, we see like so many awesome, awesome, awesome women, um, who are, um, making things are, are helping to shape things to be the way that yeah. we know that they can be. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And I, and I, one last thing I will say that I do know that there's a lot of folks um, who don't identify, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, that have different identifications mm-hmm. on the, on the, you know, they're not binary. Yeah. And I, you know, b- love that we can say that now. And it's not like such a shocker. And, you know, um, I look forward to working with all different kinds of communities and and all different kinds of identifiers. And you just wanted to put that out there, you know, as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, we have been, uh, we've just spent this last bit of time here talking with Miss Regina Anderson, who's the executive director of the food recovery network, Regina, if people wanted to talk to you about the efforts that you're doing, maybe get a little bit of insight in your career path, or just simply learn more about what's happening with food recovery, how, how would you prefer they reach out to you? So I hope that everyone does reach out to me. I love talking. <laughs> As you can see, I love talking with you, Diana. Um, you know, I, 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 please be in touch with me. You know, I have, I have jobs for you to do, you know, like, yeah, I'm sure you have resources for me. Like that's, yes. let's keep the conversation going. So okay. um, one of the best ways is to just, um, you know, you can email me. I think the best way um, is to email um, at info at, Okay. foodrecoverynetwork.org. And I say okay. that because, um, you know, like a lot of us, we're yes. really inundated with email and yes. I want to make sure that we don't miss anything. So there's yes. that, um, you know, please go to our website. There's all kinds of information there that you okay. might find. I hope that's um, helpful to you, foodrecoverynetwork.org. I'm on social media. Regina DM is my personal Twitter. Um, and okay. I'm on Twitter all the time. So I, I hope that people um, feel like they, they want to continue the conversation. And thank you for of creating course. that on ramp. Oh, Regina, thank you so very much for your time today and for all the work that you're doing. And I'm really excited to watch how Food Recovery Network continues to evolve and grow into an even bigger force for good. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we'll look forward to catching you next time. It was really great to have you with us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe and share with your network. Until next time, be well and do gooder. Gooder.